Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas. Uh, we had a great one here. Uh, um, we had, uh, it, was, it was different than usual, and I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Uh, but I hope your Christmas was excellent, and I am definitely looking forward to 2022. Uh, you know, I'm never one of these guys who's like, ah, this past year was terrible, but this next year is going to be great. I always kind of think like, every year's got its share, you know, of good and bad. And I know 2022 will be the same. I just hope it's a lot more prosperous for us all and a lot more um, healthy and just chill. I hope people take their chill pills this year. What do you say? Shall we take our chill pills this year, people? All right. Uh, but not real pills, of course. OK, so uh, coming up on the show, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to take a look at all that stuff. But first, uh, I want to show you what I was carrying in my in my pocket today. I was going to say in my front right, but I also had something in my waistband today. No tertiary knife, uh, except one that I had to fiddle with. But so I'll include that too. Uh, but today's front right pocket main carry was the Fox Knives um, MK Ultra designed by the great Jason Knight. You know, Jason Knight, he was a uh, he was a host on Forged in Fire, kind of a substitute host, but great guy, very funny, has awesome attitude, makes incredible uh, kukri knives. Kukri, he makes these sort of Bowie kukri hybrids and kukris like this. And so he basically got together with Doug Markaida, got used some of Doug, uh, Doug Markaida's contacts at Fox Knives. This was several years back and collaborated on this design. Uh, which is pretty much very, very heavily. This is mostly Jason Knight right here. I think Doug Markaida was just kind of the foot in the door for him at a major manufacturer like Fox, where Markaida has had a lot of his collaboration knives made. And uh, they had this produced. Uh, the second iteration, that's this one, Doug Markaida's name fell off of the thing and it became uh, Knight, and, uh, Knight and Elements because at this time it was only offered through Tactical Elements. Now it's kind of offered far and wide. Uh, but just a really cool blade, a storied blade. And after that first um, Markaida Knight iteration, I thought it went away for good. And I was really bummed uh, because I asked for it one year for Christmas. And my wife was like, yeah, sure. 250 bucks for a knife. What are you nuts? And then uh, several years later, it came back and I asked for the same thing. She's like, sure, just send me the link. <laughs> it's just so exhausted by life, you know. <laughs> life so uh yeah that's how i wound up with this awesome folding kukri uh it's on bearings you've got the black anodized titanium um on the uh, lock side a nice uh, sort of neutral looking clip i like that central um pivot point or not pivot point but screw down point for the clip uh which is echoes the the pivot in shape and style and it has that awesome micarta that fox is fond of using um, I really like it. I don't think it's American micarta, but it is good micarta. Um, yeah, so that's what I had in my front right pocket. I did not feel under knived with that slightly over four inch blade. By the way, this knife is so svelte and light in the pocket. It does not seem uh, this this, you know, uh, four inch plus blade does not seem like a big knife to carry around. Uh, it's kind of one that you forget about, actually. So that's the uh, Fox and Jason Knight Tactical Elements Kukri MK Ultra, it's called. Uh, second in my waistband, I, I've been talking about it a lot, so I won't go on at length. Uh, but this awesome Hogtooth Knives uh, EDC Tanto. I say I won't go on at length, and I see Jim. I can just see Jim in my mind, mind's eye, just like, yeah, sure, Bob, shaking his mouth, uh, shaking his head, saying, you know, prepare for the word salad because he's got one of his favorite knives in hand. Uh, I, I will just say I'm very happy I I, I got this and uh, very happy to have it. It it carries so well. This, if you're not looking, it's a three and a half inch bladed EDC uh, Tanto. The, the blade is somewhat uh, Chris Reeve Knives Tanto style in that it's got that abrupt wedge style tip and it's deeply hollow ground, very thin behind the edge and very, very uh, um, kind of a broad grind there too so just 
you know, slips through things like it's nothing. Uh, I used this to feather stick one day. I just pulled it out while I was uh, preparing for for a uh, family fire pit. By the way, when I make a feather stick, I still light the damn thing with a bick. So I'm just doing the feather stick to use my knives. That's it. I mean, I'm not trying to be a survivor, man. However, I wouldn't. I, I should take it more seriously and get better at making fires. But I do light the feather stick with a pick. Anyway, this does make exquisite feather sticks. It was unexpected. I brought two other knives out with me. Uh, one of them was the Harvester from Finch Knives. Very thin um, blade. I was expecting that to make great feather sticks. But I found myself being gentle with it, not trusting the pivot necessarily. Not that the not that it's not a robust knife for what it is, but it's a little folding knife. And I didn't want to go to town on wood. I can't remember what the other one I had was. That sounded funny. I, I can't remember what the other thing I had was, but uh, uh, I did have this. I busted it out, and uh, this made tremendous feather sticks. Very, very sharp. Uh, 154 CM blade steel. This is from a guy whose uh, whose main gig is forging knives, but he does some stock removal knives like this, uh, water jetted out of 154 CM. That way we can get affordable uh, versions of his designs. I love this thing. Check out uh, Matt Chase's knives hog tooth knives and uh see what he's got um also if you like kitchen knives man he is definitely a guy to go check out all right lastly uh i had this on me it was the car knife it was the desk knife it was not uh, uh you know it was not a a plan you know b c or d knife it was just a have fun with knife and it's the cogent i love this thing this is the civivi cogent their new uh button lock flipper they did a great job with it uh, i'm no engineer but i understand that button lock flipper design is a challenging uh style design and um you know protec through various iterations has perfected it and uh, a couple of other companies um but i guess protec is is chief chief in mind to me so when they came out with this i was very excited because uh, it also happened while i'm going through this kind of irrational little civivi kick i think it, it might be on the wane at this point because i've i've kind of gone hog wild uh recently but um having this button lock come along right at the time i happened to be actively buying civivis was nice because this is a fun knife to fidget with i know i know greg medford a real man doesn't fidget but I swear I'm a real man, and I like to do this uh, repeatedly when no one else is around, and sometimes at inappropriate times when others are around. Um, so I don't know what that makes me, uh, but I do love this knife, and I think they nailed it. And for 70 bucks, I was looking at it today. For 70 bucks, you can get it in this half serrated, uh, either in this red uh, color handle or with the natural jg10 and then you can get the jg10 in uh, i mean you can get the rest of them all with black blades various uh different color g10s the purple one like we gave away for the gentleman junkie giveaway and uh and others including green micarta which is only one dollar more it's one dollar more to get a green micarta handle on your civivi cogent so th these things are cool there's 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 only one excuse not to have a no there are only two excuse i don't know there are several excuses not to have a civivi cogent and i get them all uh but if you don't have an excuse i highly recommend it all right civivi cogent a clip point blade this was my panoply today is that right panoply or is that just for armor anyway so today i had the uh, mk ultra the uh edc tanto by hogtooth and the civivi cogent such cool knives uh, great uh, feat of engineering are these knives, and uh, wow! That so uh, when I think of engineering, I'm thinking of this next person. I just want to mention today uh, that uh, my wife and her family, and I and my family lost her father this uh, past week, and uh, so my father-in-law died this past week, and he was a a great man, Jerry Davies. He went by JJ in his uh, young days. And he was an engineer and uh, could fix anything, could kind of build anything. One of those guys. We talk to those guys a lot on this show, and they're always inspirational um, in what they can do in their self-reliance. But here was a, a man who had that, uh, had that ability for self-reliance uh, in my life, uh, among others. And uh, he, he, was, he was a great father-in-law and a great person to know. And, uh, well, I just want to remember him here. So, uh, JJ, cheers to you, sir. We called him Papa. 
Um, so he was also a guy that I would show my knives off to when I got them, because though he didn't collect them, he certainly appreciated them, their engineering and their usefulness as tools. So uh, you will be great, uh, greatly missed Jerry Davies. Uh, here's to you, sir. All right. So uh, coming up on the Knife Junkie podcast, we're going to take a look at uh, the Civivi riffle that I neglected to bring downstairs and show you last week. And then we'll get to the top 10 acquisitions of 2021. But before we do any of that stuff, we will uh, take a look at uh, Knife Life News. There is some exciting news in the knife world and um, and 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 that kind of thing, uh, <laughs> that kind of thing coming up. So uh, if you think what we do here is valuable, please help us out on Patreon and uh, help yourself out, too. You know, you get some stuff back. Uh, you have an opportunity to win a knife every month. Uh, you uh, get some extras, including interview extras from all these uh really interesting people I keep uh, I, I keep being lucky enough to talk to on this show. So definitely check us out on Patreon. Quickest way to do that is to go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. I will say that address one more time because it is long and complicated, but it is the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. So, you know, the Ontario Knife Company um, line of knives, they call them Old Hickory. The Old Hickory line of knives, they're kind of kitchen knives, kind of camp knives. They're kind of all around knives. They look like something a pioneer would carry. Uh, I believe it's 1095 or 1075. <clears throat> uh, uh, high carbon stainless, or high carbon stainless, high carbon steel. Uh, and then it has, you know, hickory handles, I'm assuming. Uh, but they're very basic looking uh kitcheny knives and and such well uh but they they also are outdoorsy and with the with the um old hickory lineup they started issuing these very kitchen looking knives with sheaths uh realize and, and they stoutened the blade i believe a little on some of them to make them uh better hunters but they they sort of saw that these uh traditional uh culinary or sort of camp kitchen knives they were making uh were 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 perfect for for omni knives for camp and hunting and outdoors knives so that's where the old hickory thing came from well that's all long to say they are now making a folder which is which is interesting to me because this folder here uh looks like it fits in the old hickory lineup and it's a slip joint and you can see it's got a little opening hole a divot right towards the front sort of lozenge shaped and uh, and you know, you can see it's a two hand knife, very simple. It's got the hickory or the wood handle and it says old hickory in the side. It looks just like it belongs in the lineup of old hickory knives. This is 1075 by the way. Um, but the thing that's interesting to me is that, uh, very frequently on the interview show, when I speak with people who make, um, knives in a more traditional way, whether they forge knives or they make, uh, more, um, traditional style knives, fixed blade knives. When I ask them if if they're thinking of making a folder, this is always what I'm thinking of. And usually they're not thinking of this. Usually they have something in mind and it's more more titanium-ish or you know, more modern than what I think a fixed blade maker would make, especially if they make sort of traditional fixed blades. So uh when I saw this knife, it was a it was an interesting moment because I thought, okay, this is the knife that's been in my mind's eye like kind of a hundred times. That I've asked this question. Uh, so it's cool to see someone making it for real. You know, this isn't exactly uh, how I had it designed. It was a clip point blade in my mind, maybe closer to a 110. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, so I'm very interested to see this. Uh, it's it's coming out. It's being announced sort of concurrent with SHOT Show, which will be in January. So I guess that's when they're when they're coming out with this, but 1075 and, uh, and a slip joint. And it'll be interesting to see if they go down the locking or back lock or you know uh down that path and and flex their muscles with the uh with the folding but i could see them wanting to just kind of dip their toes first because uh people i would imagine people loyal to the old hickory brand are loyal to the fact that they are uh very 
uh, useful fixed blade knives and probably they have the small ones and so we'll see how much how much use this has but i i think it's interesting and i'm excited by it another thing that's interesting is uh knife news with sog knives you know sog knives uh sog has uh you know had a had a history uh in uh, of glory and then some dark days and then a rebirth and now part of this rebirth you know they started rebranding uh the sog line two years ago and just smartened up the designs modernized them a bit and turned their back on the big box stores and what is expected by big box store knife buyers we'll say so they cleaned up the image and uh two two and a half three years later gsm has purchased them gsm outdoors uh who bought cold steel last year um has bought sog knives this year and where with cold steel there was a panic a feeling of uh, st uh make sure you stay on this page jim i want to point something out when i'm done bloviating here but uh with cold steel it was like oh no you know what will happen to cold what will become of cold steel that was my immediate instinct when they got bought my immediate instinct with sog was like oh maybe this is a ray of hope and i hate to put it that way because i think they're rebranding has been quite successful i think it i mean in in my humble opinion i think it has i think i think it's resonating with people but it, you know obviously they need a little more uh, wind in the sails and gsm will definitely give it to them i think gsm who uh, uh they own dozens of companies uh related to hunting uh accessories and and that kind of thing uh, the hunting world accessories for the hunting world i think they take the knife acquisition certainly of cold steel very seriously uh, i i think they want to i think they see the the uh exploded and ever growing market knife market and they're and they're happy to have that foothold with cold steel because no one else uh had ever done what cold steel did they have they already had a niche carved out so gsm is kind of just uh, you know buying into something that's very well established sog has the name they're struggling uh for credibility with hardcore knife nerds but uh you know they have the name and, and brand recognition and uh hopefully you know with this rebranding and now being purchased by gsm they will continue on the righteous path to pleasing me and uh and others of my ilk and taste so gsm uh, acquiring SOG. SOG, congratulations. I can only assume this is a very positive uh, um, development for you. So there you go. Still to come on the Knife Junkie podcast, we take a look at the Civivi I forgot to show last week, and then the top 12 acquisitions of 2021 in the Knife Junkie collection. Coming up. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. Terry rounds. All right. So next up, the Civivi Riffle. This is the one I was so excited to show you last week, and then uh, I left it. I left it elsewhere. Uh, I bought this uh in a two two knife package from blade hobby thanks again blade hobby for an awesome purchasing uh purchasing experience and two great knives that came in great condition uh the civivi riffle and i got the brazen too with the maroon handle black blade tanto but uh, this was the one i was really excited for uh this is a knife that is much beloved by many of the trusted knife voices on youtube chief among them uh in my mind right now jared uh, Neve of Neve's Knives. He loved this knife. And um, so I, uh, I, at first, when it first came out, the Riffle, I was like, that's a dumb name. And then I looked at it and I was like, eh, yeah, I don't know if I like how it looks. And then, and then, uh, and then news started coming in on how great it was. And, and then I started to fall for the looks. And then eventually, I don't know, you know how that happens. I, eventually it became like, oh, I have to have this thing. And then I saw it in this great deal. Any case, I got it. I dig it. As a matter of fact, I've used it a lot since I've gotten it. And this is 14C28N blade steel. It's a thin blade stock. And it comes to a very thin edge. And you can see here a little bit of glinting. Maybe glinting isn't the right term, but you can see if you look at the edge, 
right near the center, right about there in the center of the blade. You can see it's almost like a wobble. It's, I think I may have used it a little too hard when I used it. And you know me, uh, I was doing some hardcore sort of survival thing. Uh, I don't know what I was doing. I can't remember now. I think I was cutting tons of cardboard because I have cut tons of cardboard with this. Um, and uh, I think that might be it. But my my whole point in saying this is that it, it it's such a thin edge that I, I I made little tiny waves in it, I think. Uh, that weren't there before, so I'm gonna take it to the, uh, take it to the, um, and they don't drop out. I'll take it to the sharp maker and see what happens after that, and uh, and just just love and cherish this knife. I really do dig it. I like the uh, micarta, and as you can see, yesterday I used it in the kitchen, and something. I'm I'm wondering what this is. Probably I got oil on my finger or something, and and touched it. Uh, but hey, character. I'm liking the character. This uh, this micarta will get really nice and shiny and dark on the on the edges. It's already starting. Uh, one thing I want to mention about this uh, knife, besides the excellent blade and the excellent action, of course, you can spidey flick it. Uh, you can slow roll it with your thumb if you pinch. For me, you got to pinch it with both sides uh, and use the flipper and all that. Uh, but ergonomics are so good on this knife. And look at it; it's just a uh, a, a rectangle with a downward cant. Well, the rectangle with the downward cant in this position nestles into your into your uh, palm just perfectly. It's really, really good in this grip, in like a saber grip. It's great in a hammer grip if you just have to uh, horse down on some cardboard. Just keep going through. And then if you if you get in some sort of a knife fight while you're in the alley cutting down the cardboard, right here you got a really nicely shaped blade for reverse grip. I always talk about how um, it's a good idea to cap the pommel with your thumb. If you're if you've got a knife in reverse grip, it me means you're you're trying to puncture, you know, come down hard on something. And I'm not even talking like uh, my joke tactical scenario, but you know, if you're if you're holding a knife like this, you're you're trying to puncture into something. So you definitely want to cap that. Uh, cap that that pommel with your thumb so there's no chance or so that the chances are greatly lessened that uh, through the shock of hitting whatever you're hitting your hand slides onto the blade uh, which just be awful all that being said this is the perfect shape for that purpose perfectly perfectly shaped and that thumb and just this curve here and your thumb just comes down here it has plenty to hook over it's curved on that top uh, facet there and it's just comfortable and great. This is such a great knife. I really like it. Uh, a, a lot of the Civivis look the same to me. This does not look the same. Uh, this is a, an interesting design, and I'm really happy happy to have it in my collection. I, I'm been thinking about it, and who knows, uh, as days go forward, and and my my little dalliance with Civivi comes to an end. Who knows? I might sell some of them, but but this one I'll probably keep because I really dig the riffle. All right. What else do I dig? Well, I had to think of this year, you know, uh, I, I am not the guy to come to for the best knives of the year that were uh, created and released in that year, because, <clears throat> you know, I'm kind of guided by my collection and my collection is guided a lot by the people I interview in a lot of ways. Uh, um, I try to acquire something, you know, if I can, or if it's within, a reach and you know many people are not within reach for me uh, but if i can so you'll see some of that here uh, but these are the these are the 12 best things i acquired this year uh bought all of them bought all of them but i would i've been gifted a number of really great things this year too actually no the very last one i was gifted all right so let's get into it what are my top 12 acquisitions for 2021 uh, the first one you've already seen tonight, so I'll go really quickly into this. That's the Hogtooth EDC Tanto. I carry this thing all the time. It's got the perfect handle size, and that pommel is perfectly shaped to um, where in the waistband it does not poke. It just uh, It's very, very ergonomic, both in and out of the sheath. And as I mentioned before, extremely sharp, beautifully ground, very thinly hollow ground. For, for a guy who swings a hammer... And uh, and forges hot steel. 
like a lot of the time, Matt Chase is a great grinder. Man, he can grind a blade beautifully. All right, so next up is, mm, this was a big one for me this year. In my favorite handle color, again, this sort of maroon color, I just keep coming back to it. It's unplanned, but it's just compelling to me, the color. Uh, but this knife was, you know, uh, a white whale for a while. This was a knife I've been trying to get, and uh, I was just not staying on top of things, not being aggressive enough in getting one, and, uh, you know, not being smart enough in getting one. And then other knives, you know how it is. I was... Uh, other knives that I also wanted very badly presented themselves easier to me. So my money kept going to those places. Well, one day I was in a meeting at work and I got a text and uh, I looked at it uh, because I wasn't speaking. And uh, well, what was it? It was a lineup of six or eight AD 20s in the cabinet at River Edge, uh, River's Edge Cutlery, and it was a message from Lavender Pants 86 and he said, Bob, I know you want one of these, or you've been wanting an 80-20. Uh, there are six here. They're going to go fast. If you want one, pick one out. I'll buy it, and you can pay me back. And that's what we did. You know, that's the story I love to tell because that was, that was just something. Someone, he did not have to do that. He went out of his way. Um, you know, to help someone he had never met in real, real life. And I thought that was pretty cool. So I did it. I left the room as if there was, <laughs> I shouldn't, I left the room, left the meeting for a minute as if there was something that other people would consider more important than a knife purchase happening and um, <clears throat> made that arrangement. And this arrived several days later and just blew me away. I remember it, it showed up right before we went to a dinner party. And uh, of course, this came to the dinner party with me. And, um, you know, there were a couple of opportunities. We were with close friends, so they know my sickness. So there were a few opportunities to show it off or to take it out and use it uh, un unsolicited. Um, but, okay, all, all the backstory aside, this knife is amazing. What do I love about it? It is the quintessential um it's got a few things going for it. It is the quintessential hard use folding knife. No doubt about that. It's also the quintessentially innovative knife uh, with this shark lock. So I just think, I think Andrew Demko and uh, the Demko brothers and Demko knives, I just think that they are, they're like the Wright brothers. I mean, you know, they didn't create human flight, but what I mean is they, they're just a creative force, like a genuine creative force. They're not out there uh, trying to figure out and trying to like surf the trends and figure out what people are going to want next. They're just making the most unique and useful and strong and, uh, you know, innovative stuff they can practical and uh, it's resonating and they're just making the most amazing knives. And plus cold steel doesn't have their, their their meat hooks in them anymore and they're free to they're free to innovate and and make the kind of strength uh you know high strength high performance uh product cold steel you know he was done designing for cold steel but he gets to make it to his own specifications all right all that being said you know all about this knife and now i'm just going off but look at this color so beautiful and i love that texture uh in in the handle so this is definitely one of my favorites of the year. Great uh, of my acquisitions of the year. Great in the um, in this grip, the saber grip. Great with your thumb up there. It's great in every grip. Everything about that knife is outstanding. Uh, I've seen people since it's pretty. You know, it's a pretty chunky blade, and it's it's extremely sharp. But it's also kind of wedge like behind the behind the edge. Uh, you know, it's it's not it's not you know it's pretty beefy. I've seen people do regrinds, and that's one knife I would not regrind. That's a knife I would keep. It is still very sharp. You're going to do all the cutting you need to do, but that knife in particular, I don't need that knife to be like a cheese slicer. I just need that to be, I need the blade to be as hardcore as the rest of it because that's what my lifestyle demands. Okay, next, uh, the Vero Synapse. This is a Blade Show purchase, and uh, it was definitely not one I was planning on making. And uh, I went over to the Vero booth 
I wanted to, while I was there, say hi to everyone that I could possibly say hi to and shake their hands in real life. People who spent time with me, spent an hour of their time talking to me on the show. I really appreciate it. So I wanted to go introduce myself. So I went up there and man, I was immediately smitten with his knives that, uh, you know, I, I respected them in talking to him and then also seeing videos from uh, my my trusted mavens, the the people I trust the most to review knives all loving it you know i knew it was going to be great but when i picked it up just picking it up and flipping it and holding it made all the difference it was the same thing with the koenig uh, arius the only difference or problem is is i didn't walk off with the koenig arius uh but this synapse is one of my favorite folders in my collection i just absolutely love it the the build is it just you know it's impeccable and the design is really impeccable um, one little um, stumbling point in the design that other people have mentioned is that ramp uh, on the clip. Now, to me, it's not much of an issue because this knife is small enough. That's a three inch blade that uh, when I do carry it and when I have occasion to use it, I usually choke all the way up, put uh, my middle two fingers in that big finger choil there, my forefinger on the um, front portion here, the bolster and use it like that. So the this tall ramp here on the clip goes right in the palm of my hand where there's the largest void. I don't feel it. Uh, but in if you were to use it in this sort of position where you've got your front two fingers in that choil and you were back here in saber, yeah, you feel it. You feel it right there. But not a deal breaker. And he's addressed it in, in subsequent uh, iterations. Oh. <sighs> I, I sigh wistfully because he just came out with a with an XL version of this, which is way more in my size range. And um, yeah, I don't have that one. <laughs> I want it. I want it. This is a bolster lock, as you can see. And uh, this is M390 blade steel. And here's a cool little design feature that just tells you that a knife enthusiast, knife lover designed this knife on the... Um, Offside on the clips on the lock side, you have this divot built into the blade. And of course, what's that for? That's for spidey flicking. That's for middle, middle finger flicking. Uh, and I think that's so cool. Such a cool touch. And I love the asymmetry. I'm very glad that there isn't that on the other side for whatever reason, just, just visually. Uh, the other great thing about this knife is the flipping action. The, the, the blade flies out effort, effortlessly. And that is due to this amazing little flipper tab. It's just basically uh, the tang, jimped and rounded, and the bolster cut away to reveal it, kind of like how people used to do the flipper mods on the original uh, Boker Quakens. They would take it and, and just sort of carve away the front of the bolster, front top of the bolster, and then put a few jimps in the tang of the blade, and then boom, you got a flipper. So uh, <clears throat> Joseph Vero of Vero Engineering, codified that i know others have done that too but uh, to me that's one of the one of the great things about this design is that it flips it flips out like it's like it has a giant uh to quote to quote nick shabazz pocket pecker like it has a giant flipper sticking out this far that's that's how nicely it flips out being completely low profile so what a great knife outstanding knife and um that natural canvas micarta is slowly taking on patina. I just don't carry the knife enough to get it to get that rich darkness. Okay, so what's next? Next is a bladed implement, yes, uh, but it's not a knife, but it's also a blade show purchase. This is my Elmer Rouge spiked tomahawk. Here, I'm gonna, I'll put it under the knife cam, but I like, this hangs on the wall, usually right behind my noggin, right there where you see that empty spot next to the Knife Junkie logo. Uh, this this is the only thing on that wall uh, that is not vintage. Uh, there's even one vintage thing on there that's kind of a vintage fake, which is kind of cool. Uh, but this is the only thing up there that that was built in the last year. But man, he built this thing. It, it so Elmer Roosh is a is a legend uh, in Georgia um, for making this kind of implement, forging axes forging tomahawks, uh, forging hammers, and different kind of things, uh, uh, 
these kind of implements and then hanging them on these beautiful hickory handles. And he's got this whole recipe to uh, burn the handle and then impregnate it with, with linseed oil and all this stuff. And it's just a, a, a beautiful piece. And this last year, I really got into tomahawks, um, the Wingard wearable tomahawks, uh, and just thinking about a time when these were a preferred weapon you know and and also a preferred survival a day-to-day -day implement but but very much a weapon these things um and it's cool to know that there are people like elmer Rouge uh making them in the old-fashioned way so this has uh this this has a hardened uh uh i can't remember 1075 up front and on the on the spike i believe and then i can't remember what the what the middle steel is i think it's more of a softer milder steel uh but just a, a beautiful beautiful thing i'm going to put it here and somehow fit it into the picture my elmer Rouge tomahawk interesting funny story this is uh uh on blade show after the first day i saw um uh, andrew demko walking around with a couple of of uh, these tomahawks and i i asked him butted up asked him excuse me where'd you get those and he was like, Elmer Roosh, dude, he's right over there. He makes the best. Time. And I went over and I was like, oh, this is exactly what I've been thinking of, like this kind of tomahawk. So uh, I felt like I got a good endorsement because um, Andrew Demko's a big tomahawk collector. So there you go. OK, next up, Kramer Knives, Kramer Custom Knives Voodoo. Uh, this is um, just uh, this is my second or this and the Hogtooth EDC are my two most carried uh, uh, fixed blade knives because they both ride so, so nicely. Uh, this rides really nicely because though it is not as short as the EDC uh, Tanto from Hogtooth, it is much, oh my God, it's much thinner. Uh, we'll see if this is a disaster. I'm going to freak out. Bro. Um. No. Oh, God. Look at that. It's my lucky day. I dropped this knife. It fell out of the sheath. And this is a pretty stout sheath, man. I don't know how it fell out, but it fell out of the sheath and I didn't blunt the tip. Man. So these are great knives. <laughs> uh, so this is a, a uh, Kramer custom knife. Eric Kramer is the maker. There is a, a famous kitchen knife knife maker named Bob Kramer different uh, different outfit uh, this is his voodoo model it is an upswept hollow ground very thinly hollow ground upswept uh, 154 cm persian style blade i always call it a clip blade because this swale makes it look like a clip point to me uh, but uh, he calls it persian and he should know he made it and uh, when i bought it from him i asked him to double edge it and though this is a very sort of oblique angle he put a sharp edge on it great for i would imagine uh gouging and tearing kind of cuts uh back cuts and flicks uh not a slicing sort of edge but this most definitely is a slicing edge very 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 thin already it's a thin blade stock and a thin handle but that coming down together con uh concaved so thin it's uh it's just a great knife and uh, you know, it could be more of a utility knife, but the way I had him set it up, it's more of a, you know, uh, you know, it's more my, to my taste, a little more self defense with the, with the double edge. Uh, so yeah, that's the Kramer custom knives, um, voodoo. Awesome. Double edge knife. Uh, next up one that I got from, uh, this is from, um, blade freak and, uh, he takes great care of his knives, and he has a small and disciplined collection of knives. He got one in. He had to let one go, and this is one he let go. And I eagerly, eagerly snapped this one up. He he gave me a good price on it, and it's just uh, an amazing knife. This is the Chris Reeve Knives Umnumzan Tanto. Uh, Umnumzan, I think it means boss. Sebenza means work. Umnumzan, I think it means boss. Um, but if it doesn't, it'll do till the boss gets here because this thing is, uh, interesting and so like stout and badass in, a, in many ways. 
first of all, let's look at the blade really quickly. Um, that is a nicely thinly hollow ground. Uh, uh, this is S35. This is an older one. S35 uh, blade here. The previous owner got it really sharp on some sort of a consistent angle sharpener. And then also did the, the tip. I love the Chris Reeve knives wedge like tip on their tantos. And this one has sort of a, well, it's got a swedge almost like a harpoon uh, that terminates in this uh, thumb swale here, which is great for doubling down on the power of whatever you're cutting. And uh, it's a great place to choke up. But if you don't want to choke up, you've got this raised portion here. Uh, some might call it a thumb ramp, but it's more like a thumb plateau. Uh, not really a ramp, and it's nicely jimped. Um, yes, it will give you some purchase, but it's also there for indexing um, and for scratching the pad of your thumb if it itches. Uh, you've got this really cool cross-hatched milling, but not over the entirety of the handle, which I like aesthetically. Uh, they give you the option to have the lanyard or not, and they give you a replacement uh, barrel here. Uh, unlike my Sabenza, uh, when I got that, my Sabenza 21, I decided to not have the clip or not have the um, the little fob thing and had to remove the whole pin. Uh, otherwise, it was just free floating. Uh, you've got a very sturdy frame lock. I, I thought this clip placement would be a problem. It is not. Not for me anyway. I, I do not feel the clip. It is not an issue at all. Um, though I just think that I usually like a clip kind of riding half on the lock bar, half on the body. But in this case, it's just just doesn't matter. Uh, Idaho made got some really nice snail trails that uh, most of which I did not make uh, on the aluminum on. You do have the hinderer style uh, lock bar. Uh, in, um, was that stabilizer over travel disc thing so that you don't uh, bend out the the lock in a in an aggro moment here on the very the like oddly smooth thumb studs you have um which are also the blade stops by the way you have a really nice uh, place to put a ring they have little rubber rings that catch your thumb and then of course this knife is known for its really incredible uh lock bar interface slash detent ball which are one thing one ceramic ball kind of cantilevered onto the corner of this edge here and it acts both as the detent ball when the knife is closed and then the lock bar interface when the blade is open so i mean just an innovative knife worth every penny and uh strong and beautiful just a great knife. Uh, and I have to say, if you're going to make the Sabenza and then follow it up with something, this was a great follow-up. Okay, next up is the uh, is another, um, well, self-defense custom fixed blade knife, which I've, I've done a number of this year. I've gotten a number of this year. And um, so choosing was not easy because there are a, a number of great ones that didn't make it onto this list. Uh, but this was a knife I had been lusting for for a number of years and uh, or I guess maybe just a couple of years. But uh, when <laughs> in a in an unguarded moment, I happened to be looking at my phone and uh, and boom, I, I was on Instagram and uh, they uh, Brian Moreland uh, of JB Knives uh, knife and tool dropped that they were going to have these things coming out. So I jumped on it really quickly and uh, I got it and I was so psyched and you could choose your edge configuration. So I had to double edge it, of course. Uh, but this is a, a pick hall style knife by design. So, so the original design does not include a front edge. It's just a back edge for pick hall style fighting or pick hall style uh, self-defense, but call referring to tip down edge in, uh, which capitalizes on the sort of arcing motion of, of your various joints and, and how you would be spazzing and in caveman mode. If you really were in a knife fight, probably not capable of the delicate and intricate things that you might have learned in your colleague class, but more likely to just be like a sewing machine. Uh, so that's what the Pakal style grip or Pakal style blade capitalizes on. This one has a forward edge sharpened, so it's twice as bad. 
So uh, love this thing. And <laughs> it's got ridiculously thin uh, blade stock. That's what the ditch uh, in the JB knives uh, refers to. They have all of their knives. This is originally called the pick, but the ditch pick features a very thin blade steel. And I uh, had him on the show and we were talking about testing it. And he said he pounded the, the, these, uh, you know, with a hammer into two by fours and stuff. And and they they just kept coming back for more these little tiny thin. They, it's almost like the blade stock from a cheap, uh, you know, steak knife or something. And uh, I don't know the way they heat treat it. He said it was incredible. I'm not going to do that. This is a collection. I don't need to know, you know, uh, that mine will go through a two by four. But knowing that he has done that. Uh, I like so great little knife. This is also an excellent in the waistband uh, at three o'clock knife. And I've got an ulti clip on it. Not so crazy about the ulti clip. Uh, it's OK. It's OK. I definitely prefer the uh, discrete carry concepts clips uh, a little more. OK, next up is another. OK, so we're on a little streak here. And uh, so this is this is the last of my. Uh, custom fixed blade uh, Pical style knives that I got this year that I, <laughs> that is in this list. Also featuring an ulti clip, uh, but this is a good ulti clip because it's got it. This is a sentimental ulti clip. I bought this at Blade Show. See, so that's how my you know. So I can never get rid of this ulti clip. Uh, I had just bought this knife from Dirk Pinkerton. I tell the story a lot. I saw the knife across a crowded room. I loved it. Ran to it. Uh, introduce myself. Uh, I had already spoken to him on the show, but we did. He didn't recognize me, and uh, and we ch had a very lovely chat. I checked out all of his knives. He's an incredible knife maker, amazing grinder, just does beautiful stuff. A lot of his modern style fixed blades are based on traditional ethnographic designs, which I love. Bought the knife, walked away, had nothing to clip it to. Bumped into the ulti clip uh, uh, booth, and this was the last one they had on Saturday, and I bought it. So there you go. You asked. Okay, so um, Kydex sheath, very good sheath. But the star of the show, of course, is this amazing blade. This is, uh, as you can see, there's his maker's mark. It's double-edged, V-ground on both sides just perfectly. I mean, I've sat there and kind of looked on both sides and kind of flipped it. And he's a machine, man. He uh, did a great job with this. Uh, this is Nitro V, which is kind of a high-end budget steel, uh, how I've heard it described. And uh, that's a pretty considerable size. That's a pretty nice size blade for the purpose. Most of these Pical style knives are much uh, smaller than this. Uh, but, you know, you know, I had to have it. And this red and yellow handle are in odd juxtaposition. You got this really menacing black curved double-edged claw-like blade. Um, and then you have this happy red and yellow uh, contoured micarta handle. I, I think it's a beautiful juxtaposition. Uh, but that's my art school schooling coming out. I just think it looks cool. And I like the um, uh, I like the confidence it gives you when you wear it, <laughs> when you carry it. See, wear it as if it's a fashion accessory. All right. That is the Pinkerton Custom Picall Double Edge. Uh, next up is one that I got from... Our buddy Levon of the Knife Nuts podcast, and uh, more recently of the uh, from Levon from Levon from Russia with Levon, his importing business, uh, bringing in cool Russian designed knives, and this is I think the coolest one, uh, the Crystal Aurora. This is designed by Ivan Braganets and made somewhere in China by an outstanding OEM. Uh, I'm not sure who. But uh, it's everything about this knife is is stylish and um, designed. Everything is considered in this knife. Um, the thing that really got me, though, this is a, sort of a mostly symmetrical spear point blade, um, but this giant fuller on both sides just, oh, that's what got me to get on the list instantly when I saw this in his Instagram feed. Uh, again, I mean, that's like the that's like the trolling ground for it's like uh, that's where junkies go to to find their next hookup, man. Uh, but I saw this and uh, I had to get it. And it was I have to admit it was that fuller. Uh, but having it, 
I really, really like this knife. It's very thin. It's extremely light. So that's titanium. Uh, very heavily pocketed out on both sides for weight reduction. Um, you get great flipper action. Also great thumb stud slash uh, blade stop action. But the cool thing is, it. I love how it closes. It closes almost sabenzaoid. It has a... It has a hydraulic closing feel, but a, um, a a ball bearing flipper opening feel. So it it scratches two itches at once. Uh, another thing, though, uh, over the summer, this was a great summer knife because it's very stout and sturdy and sharp as hell. That fuller really gets it very thin behind the edge uh, because I, I, I believe that was somewhat of a well, it's a very thin grind anyway, uh, but great, great for light summer shorts, even swimsuit. Uh, just remember to take it out before you go to the beach or whatever. Uh, but just a great light but sturdy knife uh, and, and a looker and super unique. So very happy about that. Okay, uh, so let's see. A couple more left. The next one is also a Tomahawk. This is my Wingard wearables back ripper. Uh, this thing is just so cool. And uh, when I first saw it, I was like, weird, ah, that's arresting. It's so odd looking. And um, and then watching some of the videos. And then of course, uh, I've had uh, Zach on, on uh, Thursday Night Knives. I had him on an interview show too. And we just talk at length about his philosophy and his... Um, and his knowledge of historical tomahawks, especially from the Northeast woodland um, uh, sort of period of the Native American of Native American history, and uh, how they were used, the role that that they that they uh, filled, and then how they were made, his his knowledge and depth on the subject was so deep that I started to come around to his design, which, like I said, seemed very unconventional, but. Uh, for a spiked tomahawk, the, the thing that's different with the back ripper, uh, especially, is the spike. Here you have a spike that is used more percussively. That spike is like a pick. And in a in warfare, you might you might poke that, you know, slam that into someone's head through a helmet or something like it was traditionally used on uh, the medieval battlefield, or or you know. Or just in this situation with uh, with uh, Native Americans, you just it's just a brutal uh, percussive weapon. But in this case, he's taken that and turned it into more of a hooked, dragging, trapping, ripping weapon. And uh, and and that's what apparently what they were used for a lot. You'd see a lot of really curved spike hawks. And through research, uh, Zach Wingard discovered that it was used for different purposes other than those percussive sort of, for lack of a better term, like po pokey puncturing kind of strikes. So anyway, lots went into this. Plus, uh, Zach uh, contracts a number of uh, blacksmiths to, to um, or not blacksmiths, but bladesmiths to hammer out and create the the heads he does uh, all of the hickory handles himself these uh he takes the handles very seriously he gets this the best grained hickory from uh pennsylvania his home state and he uh gets all the grains going in the right direction i'm i'm, I'm not a woodworker but he does some of that stuff you know he does takes great pains to get really excellent handles but a big part of that is how you hang the head and it's hung on there with with wedges of the same um, wood from the same batch, so that everything expands and contracts at the same rate. <laughs> Excuse me. So, again, a lot has gone into this, uh, not just in terms of work uh, and and hours, you know, in people's hands getting it perfected, but in terms of research and and intent behind the design. Uh, so that more and more is what fascinates me is uh, is finding out what makes people tick and then buying their knives. And I'm looking at these things here and I realize that's kind of the case with everything here in one way or another. All right. Second to last, second to last knife. This was uh, one from the birthday bash in August. And I was so happy to be offered the opportunity to buy this knife. Uh, and at a at a very nice discount, I'll have you know. 
Uh, and that's due to the generosity of Marianne Halpern and Les Halpern of uh, Three Rivers Manufacturing. They sent a whole kit of swag uh, to get, for us to give away on our birthday bash uh, broadcast in August. Um, gave us a couple of sets of these uh, G Carta scales and uh, some, uh, they gave us a mug and a whole bunch of little titanium tools and stuff and, and really uh, pumped up our giveaway. Uh, but at the time, they were coming out with these DLC versions of the Atom, and they had some blems. This is a blem. If you can see right here, there's a little blemish right near the plunge line in that coating. So for that reason, they could not sell it as new, which I really respect, because to me, <laughs> I probably would not have noticed it. Uh, uh, but there you see the two dots right next to the USA on the blade. That signifies that this is a, uh, you know, a factory second. Uh, so I got a really great deal on it. And plus just, you know, having, you know, advanced word that it was coming and she gave me the opportunity to buy it. So I, I feel very, very lucky to have this knife and, uh, very lucky to have the cool G Carta scales on them. And it's just a great knife. Uh, the TRM Adam is a, is an outstanding knife and uh, this one is extra special. So that is on the list. All right. The last one, I think you probably know what it is. Uh, and uh, I, I, without further delay, I will just show it. Yes, it is from Hogtooth Knives, the maker of the first knife I showed, the EDC Tanto. This is my favorite acquisition of the year, possibly of my life. Uh, this was my 50th birthday knife commissioned by my parents. Uh, after, after the interview I did with Matt Chase of Hogtooth Knives, I told my dad, hey, I think I'm going to buy myself a birthday knife from him. My dad said, say no more, you know, send him a design. It's on us for, you know, for being a, our son for 50 years. And I really, 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 really appreciate it. And so they worked it out amongst themselves. And I ended up with this knife. Um, and uh, I saw Matt at uh, the at Blade Show. And I saw him as he was picking out this stag. I wanted a stag sub hilt fighter uh, of, of, uh, Bob Loveless, you know, lineage. And, uh, I wanted pattern weld Damascus steel and the whole nine yards. And that's what he gave me. And this, or that's what he sold my parents. And this thing is beautiful. And, uh, this was the first sub hilt fighter that Matt ever made. And, uh, certainly, uh, had some major issues with the handle and the stag. And, and, uh, you can, you can hear him talk about, the creative challenges and solutions he came up with in putting this thing together uh, on the podcast we did a couple of weeks. Oh, let's see in September. Sorry, I don't have the the number. You can just look that up. I did two podcasts with him, and uh, the second one he talks about making this one double edged, as is traditional for a loveless sub hilt fighter. It's a long, slender clip point, and that top. Uh, edge is completely sharpened and uh, a little bit smaller uh, than that bottom edge. Both are hollow ground and it's uh, um, 1095 and N6, uh, not N690, 1095 and, uh, and uh, mm, 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 mm. I'm, I'm having a senior moment here, people. Um, 15 N20 and 1095. That's, that's the makeup of the steel. And of course that stag and then the gorgeously incredibly sculpted sub hilt and hilt i gotta show it from all these different aspects because he's got all these little micro facets on there um the material is from uh, the longfellow bridge in boston a friend of matt chase's did work iron work on that bridge and harvested some old iron uh, when they were taking, you know, pieces off of it to replace. So he's been, uh, he put that on this knife. So this knife has a lot of cool aspects to it. It's got history, uh, in, in its, in its materials, you know, that came from a living creature, this, this stag. And then this came from an old bridge in Boston. And, um, well, that steel was made by Matt. So everything, and the design is an old pattern. Well, from the 20th century, Bob Loveless, a classic guy. And, it came from two of my favorite people in the world, my parents, on my birthday. So, I mean, everything about this knife is the greatest, and I love it. It is uh, my absolute favorite acquisition 
of 2021 and probably will remain so for a long, long, long time. All righty. That about does it for this edition of the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, thanks for joining me and uh, taking this little trip down uh, favorite acquisitions memory lane of 2021. Uh, we uh, are soon going to be having a show where we discuss more of the best of 2021 from a different perspective. So uh, I look forward to that. Uh, also, make sure you download us on all your favorite podcast apps, Apple Podcasts, Google, iHeart, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and a whole host of others. And uh, so you can enjoy the golden tones of the Knife Junkie as you do other things rather than just sit in front of your computer. All right. So for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, my name is Bob DeMarco. And until next, I see you, please don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.